All right, thank you everyone for attending. I know it's 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 been uh, we, we've had a, lo a long couple of days. We're we're al you're almost you're oh, basically you're halfway there, right? All you just have to do is get through my talk, and then and then you're you're, you're home free with dinner um, and a night on your own, which is which is uh, which is great. So I guess uh, last but hopefully not least, uh, we're going to talk about cronyism in America. Um, the nation's first big business. This is a topic I'm very excited to present on. Um, <clears throat> I've been I've been uh, doing a lot of research on cronyism, and this is basically I want to talk about some of some of this research as I'll explain. Okay, so what is this presentation about? Right. Well, it's we we, we just had a talk on regulation. We've been hearing about all sorts of. Uh, different types of government intervention uh, throughout the various lectures, whether it's socialism, whether it's the minimum wage, whether it's credit expansion, and so on. How do ju governments justify these types of interventions? Right. Well, the traditional justification for government intervention is, well, it benefits the public. Right? That's, that's, that's the public interest theory of regulation. Right? If, if you were to ask um, uh, you know, uh, a, a government official why they do something, why they support tariffs, say they're going to say, well, I did it for my friends, my countrymen, uh, my, my, the, you know, the, the good of the human race. I, I, we supported tariffs to stimulate uh, uh, domestic manufacturing and to provide more jobs and, and so on. Uh, the reality is, 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 I would argue, different. Most laws are examples of cronyism. The tariff is really designed to block out foreign competition and protect uh, privileged domestic firms. But of course, that doesn't sound as good for electioneering purposes. And the exact same uh, type of, uh, basically, the, the, the split expectations versus reality compare, you know, when we look at credit expansion, we look at uh, the minimum wage, and so on, right? They're all examples of cronyism in reality. What do I mean by cronyism? Cronyism I'm defining as government intervention that benefits special interests at the expense of the public. Right? So special interests are pressure groups. They are groups that are motivated to get a certain policy. They have a special interest in seeing tariffs get enacted or getting credit expansion or some type of safety regulation and so on. And these laws enrich them while hurting the public overall. So far from benefiting the public, uh, they're, they're, they're hurt. Uh, far from benefiting the public, excuse me, these laws hurt the public, right? Special interests lobby for, well, special privileges. Okay, special privileges, we can kind of think of these as any sort of government intervention, and really it's, it's most of them that ends up benefiting a select few, whether it's a union or whether it's um, of various types of businesses, or even certain politicians, bureaucrats, and so on, right? Uh, th th this is really what I would argue is the defining feature of government regulation. They are, they're crony, right? All right, <clears throat> so with that in mind, if politicians are saying one thing, and of course most historians are, are agreeing with them, they're saying these laws benefit the public, and I'm arguing that the reality is quite different, well, then <laughs> uh, it seems like there's a lot of work to be done. Right? And I, I would agree, the, the task of the economic historian, or at least the economic historian that uh, views um, government regulation through the lens of, of cronyism, uh, is to uncover the actual motivations. Right? Not the stated motivations, but the actual motivations behind legislation and reveal who really benefited. You kind of have to be a detective. Right? This is sometimes deridingly referred to as a conspiracy theory of history, right? but it, 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 it's, it's meant to be an insult, but it, it, it actually really is an insult, because that's, that's kind of the truth. <laughs> the actual reasons are they're, they're not openly discussed by politicians. It would be hard for them to stay in power. Right? They're often discussed behind closed doors, in letters, in memorandum, uh, you know, and, and so on. Um, and the, the historian's job is to actually figure out what really happened. Right? And if only there was a book series that done that, that did that, I guess I'd say, if I, if I engage in some sort of uh, shameless self-promotion. I've been working on an overall history of cronyism, if you've noticed those 
the, the, the copies of, of this book, Cronyism, Liberty Versus Power in Early America, 1607 to 1849. Thanks to the generosity of Hunter Lewis, those copies have been provided uh, for free for students. So if you haven't picked them up, I, I highly recommend uh, that you do so. Uh, so this book has, goes up to 1849, so it's very early America, and a very proud, uh, very excited for the second book, Cronyism, The Rise of the Corporate Estate, kind of the next leg of history. Uh, so from these covers, I guess you just sort of imagine that cronyism is, is sort of engineered by overweight businessmen. Uh, but uh, you, can, you can see sort of the nefariousness in both of them. They're, out, they're looking out for money. And of course, in the second one, I like that picture. He's, he's flipping a coin to Uncle Sam, and he's obviously got a cigar in his mouth. So he's, he's quite content with himself, right? And so I want to be talking a little bit about uh, the, the second book. Right. So I want to be discussing a specific topic from cronyism, rise of the corporatist state. Now, what do I mean by corporatist? Right. What I really mean by corporatist or the corporatist state is it's government-run cartels and monopolies. Right. Uh, cartels, a group of sellers working to restrict supply and raise prices. A monopoly, we think of as, as, as one seller. These are kind of loose definitions, but they make sense. When, we, when, when, when they are backed by government privilege, right? Because the element of coercion has been introduced. And, and this is really the main form of interventionism during the progressive era, the so-called progressive era. Far from being an era of progress, it was really just a return to the mercantilist era. And the government was creating various cartels, a banking cartel, a cartel of meat packers, a cartel for general industry, a railroad cartel, a cartel of doctors. Last year, I spoke about the American Medical Association. Everyone had cartels. Right? There's cartels for everything, cartelize everything. Right? Uh, so I could go through the, the, the book overall. I could discuss it all. But then if I, if, if I, if I, if I told you everything about the book, you'd have no incentive to buy it. So instead, I want to hopefully kind of tantalize you, you know, maybe give you one or two sort of juicy examples, and you'd say, wow, OK, I'm interested in more. Uh, so what I want to talk about is cronyism for the nation's first, quote, big business. And I have this in capital, you know, I, I, I capitalize this because I'm, I'm, I am kind of loosely referring to big business as, as a class, so to speak, or, or different industries, large, um, uh, you know, large industries, large banks and so on. Because one of the things I argue in cronyism, rise of the corporate estate, is far from these regulations actually restricting big business, as we're, as we're often taught. The progressive era, the Federal Reserve restrained Wall Street. The Federal Trade Commission restrained industry. The Interstate Commerce Commission restrained uh, the railroads. The Meat Inspection Act restrained the meat packers. <laughs> these laws, more often than not, ended up benefiting those groups. right? And it's important to understand how they benefited these groups so we can try to figure out how laws benefit big business today. Right? And I want to talk about what is arguably the nation's first big business uh, group, if you will. And it is land grants and subsidies for the nation's transcontinental railroads. The transcontinental railroads, the railroads that went from basically the Mississippi River to the West Coast, those were the nation's first big businesses, as I will mention. Big business is understood in the modern sense. These corporations that uh, were very large relative to other, uh, other companies. Right? <clears throat> so these land grants and subsidies have often been championed uh, throughout history. Uh, this is a great example of government infrastructure. Look how much we were able to build, all of this great stuff, so on and so forth. Uh, you know, this is how the nation grew up, how it, how it modernized. So really, we have our expectations here. right? So we have Thomas the Tank Engine. I don't know if any of you played with Thomas the Tank Engine when you were young. Uh, I did. I had all my trains. Um, that's the expectations. That was what we're sort of taught. Uh, the reality is quite different, right? That's, that's devious diesel. That's Thomas the Tank Engine's nemesis, right? So what I want to argue is that these government laws were advocated as creating Thomas the Tank Engine, and instead they created devious diesel, OK? And you can just see, look how sort of evil and nefarious he is uh, right there. But anyway, I, I, I want to <laughs> really show that. So here's what I'm going to explain. I'm, I'm one, going to explain how 
Subsidies, right, monetary and land assistance caused the transcontinentals to be inefficiently constructed, okay? Uh, so obviously, you know, the railroad uh, tracks didn't, don't line up, and we have a cartoon showing that, and then we actually have the reality, right? And so you have to imagine, okay, who, 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 who screwed up here, right? Um, I want to argue that said construction enriched political elites, okay? Uh, and that the actual history of constructing this, it, it, it could have either constructing the, the nation's transcontinental railroad, uh, really the, the Central Pacific and the Union Pacific, this is something that could have happened in the Sopranos or, or some sort of uh, history of, 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 a, of a, you know, a crime organization. It was, it, was, it, was, it was almost equivalent to sort of money laundering or something like that, as I'll explain, right? And here are some of the, uh, the cast of characters that we will be discussing, the big four that ran the Central Pacific of California. We have Charles Crocker, uh, Collis Huntington, Mark Hopkins, and Leland Stanford. Okay, Leland Stanford um, uh, served as president of the Central Pacific, as we'll talk about, while he was also governor of California. So that's it's a little, little shady. And yes, uh, that is the same Stanford that then Stanford University is named after, right? And what I want to finally argue is that the transcontinentals could have been built through free market forces. Some historians, they will say, you know what? Yeah, the, the transcontinental railroads, they were built inefficiently. There was a lot of corruption, but it had to be done. It was the only way that it could be done, right? And I, I, I want to try to uh, dispel this notion and show that there was an alternative way through the Great Northern Railway or the Great Northern Railroad, right, which is a, a privately built transcontinental railroad, or at least a, a much more privately built transcontinental railroad. So we can see here that basically the entire transcontinental railroad project was crony, right? It benefited insiders at the expense of the overall public. The public would uh, have benefited more if the resources were allocated or were allowed to be allocated by uh, the free market forces, okay? All right, so that's what I want to talk about. All right, so let's jump in. Our story begins in the 1850s, right? I, I remember it like it was like it was yesterday because I read a lot of history. But anyway, our story begins in the 1850s, and railroads were America's first big business. All right, now I've said this. Now, why were railroads America's first big business? Because they generally were the first big business. Yes, we had, say, the Bank of the United States, the first bank of the United States, the second bank of the United States. But they, they, those, those government chartered central banks, they weren't quite big businesses in, 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 this, in this sense. So uh, the first thing is that they were corporations. They got corporate charters. They... Um, <clears throat> Uh, they, they, they had lots of, of stockholders, uh, and they received money from Wall Street. All right, so really, the first major business that Wall Street invested in, aside from other banks, was, uh, were the railroads. It was railroad securities and government securities. Those were really the first traded uh, financial securities on Wall Street, uh, by and large, though there were, of course, other important exceptions. Um, they were very large relative to manufacturers, all right, so most manufacturing companies at this time, they were actually not corporations. They didn't become corporations until the 1890s, where they adopted sort of the corporate form. They instead were proprietorships owned by one individual or partnerships owned by a couple of people. And the railroads in the 1850s, many of them had a market capitalization of $10 million. The largest steel firms, capitalization of $1 million. So they were, they were quite large. And of course, these railroads would, could stretch across multiple states if, uh, and, and territories, as we'll see. And they exercised enormous political influence. Right? They, 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 they mastered the lobby, as we will see. They, uh, they bribed politicians with free passes. So free passes, were they, 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 it's exactly what it sounds like. You say, hey, um, uh, you know, give us some more land or some more subsidies, and we'll give you these free passes on the railroad, because, of course, railroads were the major form of transportation. And that was a great way of, 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 uh, of bribing politicians, because if they took it, okay, you, you imagine they're going to use the railroad. Uh, if not, then no harm, no foul. Uh, the railroad can still uh, sell the seat to, say, someone else. And they also hired lawyers as lobbyists. So really, the, 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 the legal profession 
took off in the United States in the 1850s in this sense, because so many lawyers were linked to the railroad industry. Of course, uh, there's one lawyer uh, who many of you, I'm sure, know. Uh, we had a nice presentation on him uh, at the beginning of this conference. And I am referring to Abraham Lincoln, who was the lawyer for the Illinois Central Railroad, which is one of the largest railroads in the 1850s. Um, so Lincoln, as, as, as sort of the, the uh, historical propaganda goes, and even the propaganda back then, he was a rail splitter, right? Here he is, he's sweating, he's, he's, he's got this ax, he's He's, he's, he's chopping up uh, some log, and, and you know you can imagine that this is eventually going to be used in some sort of part of a railroad construction, or he's settling, a, you know, building his own log cabin, and this is how he's presenting. He was a man of the frontier, and so on. In the 1850s, uh, he was actually that, right? He was a corporate lawyer, right? Here he is. Uh, it's a great little comic, uh, but here he is explaining something. He's talking to a judge, and the judge is going like, "Oh, okay, very nice." And he got paid quite handsomely. I have a statistic here. Uh, in one case, one court case, uh, Lincoln billed the Illinois Central Railroad $5,000, and that might not sound like that much money now, but it was an amount more than three times the governor of Illinois' salary. Okay, so that's, that's quite a lot of money. He, he, he made, uh, he, was a, he was a successful corporate lawyer. Was he this super rich guy? No, but he was a successful corporate lawyer. He was also a failed politician, throughout most of his career, but he was, he was a successful lawyer, right? So railroads were the nation's first big business, and it should be no coincidence that they were the first ones to really lobby the government for subsidies and to also lobby the government for these government-sponsored cartels. We won't have time to discuss the Interstate Commerce Commission, but this is where it all kind of, uh, what it all kind of led to. All right, so... Building a transcontinental railroad. Uh, this is what the United States looked like uh, uh, in you know, early 1850. We've got all of the states; they're on the east side. Then we've got this unorganized territory, uh, and then we've got this chunk of territory called the Mexican Cession. That's just a nice way of saying we took it from Mexico. Uh, and then the Compromise of 1850 created California out of that, and and a couple of other states. And and this is what the country looked like. So the big debate in the 1850s was, all right, we, we want to build a transcontinental railroad. Why? Because we want to connect the east, really the Mississippi, because there were railroads all throughout the rest of uh, the, you know, the, the eastern side of uh, the country with the west coast, because we want to prevent the west coast from breaking off. And then we want to have a railroad connect to some large port, such as San Francisco, or that area, because then we can start to move out into the Pacific. We have sort of broad, you know, grand visions, uh, you know, of, of expansion, commercial em uh, you know, empire, really, right? So uh, the, the the plan was to subsidize construction with free land and loans. This land they could sell to speculators for money. They could sell to farmers and all this stuff. Of course, it's free land. The government, the uh, railroads, excuse me, did not have to homestead it or anything. And government loans to help them with construction. Right. So Congress agreed on a transcontinental railroad. Congress did not agree on what region would get the transcontinental railroad because whatever region got the transcontinental railroad, the other regions would not benefit. Do we have a railroad go from uh, Minnesota to uh, basically modern day Seattle? Do we have a railroad go from somewhere near Chicago and the Mississippi River around that area to San Francisco? Do we have a railroad go from Texas to uh, say San Diego or something like that, right? And this was the big debate and it got tied in with slavery because wherever the railroad went, that could benefit uh, the South or it would benefit the North and so on. And there was all of this bickering over that. And of course, uh, as the decade went on, the big debate was would it go through the Republican North or through the Democratic South? And there's all sorts of interesting discussion on Stephen Douglas, this prominent uh, uh, Democrat, and him basically pushing for a railroad to go through uh, Illinois to San Francisco because, uh, well, he had a lot of real estate holdings in Chicago and all of this stuff, but not going to, we went off time to talk about that. So instead, we're going to jump ahead to the 1860 election, right? Abraham Lincoln, he's a corporate lawyer. 
Uh, he was kind of a compromise candidate. Uh, he's the Republican nominee, and he was backed by Northern Railroad interests, and they really backed him to the hilt. Um, uh, Norman Judd, who is an attorney and director of the Chicago and Rock Island Railroad, was his campaign manager. Uh, this guy named David Davis, um, yeah, you can never trust someone who's got the same first and last name. Uh, he's a judge, he was a judge connected to the Illinois Central Railroad, and he, this is actually true, he issued a bunch of counterfeit uh, tickets to Lincoln supporters for the Republican convention, which took place in Chicago. So you could have Lincoln, everyone cheering for Lincoln, making it seem like he was sort of the, the anointed one. So he had a lot of railroad interests backing him, okay? And in the 1860 election, Lincoln wins, and no one in the South voted for him, and, and the South seceded, the South broke away. And that basically removed a large part of the Democratic Party and with the Democratic Party out of the picture, they were a minority um, compared to the Republicans, at least in the North, the Republicans can do what they please, right? And they pass all sorts of crony legislation, as uh, Dr. DiLorenzo has written about and in his various books, uh, the national banking uh, system, protective tariffs, railroads, we're obviously going to concentrate on the railroads. So this brings us to the state of California, a lot of people don't know this, but California was actually contemplating seceding, uh, breaking away during the Civil War. And this is a big issue because California was not accepting the union government's new currency, greenbacks, in circulation. And there were some people in Southern California that wanted to join the Confederacy. There's all sorts of debates. And Republicans wanted transcontinental to go through California, particularly Northern California, through San, Fran uh, San Francisco to prevent the state from seceding. Uh, this brings us to the big four Sacramento merchants that we had showed pictures of. Leland Stanford, Collis P. Huntington, Mark Hopkins, and Charles Crocker. They are eagerly on board. Uh, they want to build a railroad from California to somewhere through the, uh, you know, somewhere to connect uh, through the, to the Mississippi River. Uh, they're merchants, so having a government-sponsored railroad is going to help their businesses, of course, buying and selling goods. And... More fundamentally, and this is, this is really kind of the, the sleazy part of the railroad uh, construction, here's the picture again, is they want to make money not through operating the railroad, but through building it, right? They, <laughs> what they want to do is they want to run the construction companies, right? And they want those construction companies to charge an arm and a leg for the workers, for the railroad ties, for the coal, for all of the stuff. That's how they want to make the money, right? So uh, they're eagerly on board. They send various lobbyists to Congress to make sure their voice is heard, right? And what they also do is they get a head start on this. They charter the Central Pacific Railroad of California, right? It was chartered by California in 1861, so it had a state charter. And as I mentioned earlier, Stanford... Uh, becomes governor of California and president of the railroad. That's like the president uh, or the CEO of Apple uh, being in charge of California. It's this very awkward conflict of interest. And there's various types of you know, instances of Stanford sending his various family members out to uh, cities in California and bribing voters to vote for uh, subsidies for the railroad. It, it's really a, 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 a shady kind of enterprise. The big four, as I mentioned, they dispatch lobbyists to Washington, D.C., and they give Congress about $66,000 of Central Pacific stock, right? It's a great way of lobbying for something. You don't give them money because they could take the money and do nothing. You give them stock because the stock's only going to be valuable if they actually give special privileges to the company, right? Now, one of the most interesting things I find about all this is that Huntington, throughout his career, was known to use seductive lobbyesses. That's a term from the day. So one way of convincing politicians is you basically hire um, uh, various, various uh, women to persuade politicians <laughs> to build the railroad. So I have a great quote uh, from Emily Briggs. This is from the Olivia Letters. This is from 1869, talking about one of Collis B. Huntington's lobbyesses. <clears throat> a luscious, mellow banana a juicy, melting peach, a golden apple ripened to the very core, diamonds brilliant as the stars in Orion's jeweled belt adorn her dainty ears, 
while silk, satin, velvet, feathers, and laces. Prove what a railroad can do when its funds are applied in the proper direction, right? <laughs> so, you know, anyway, Congress decides that the Central Pacific will build from San Francisco and link up with another railroad building eastward, right? Um, <laughs> There's another instance where the, the Union Pacific, as we'll talk, uh, ended up uh, paying something like $18,000 to entertain congressmen at Willard's Hotel, which is a prominent hotel in D.C. $18,000, that's, that's $400,000 in today's money. You're like, what are they spending the money on at this hotel? Anyway, I don't know. Uh, but so they decide the Central Pacific is going to build from San Francisco and link up with another railroad building eastward. Right? And what will that railroad be? Okay, well, that's going to be the Union Pacific, as I mentioned. So the Congress is saying, well, we're going to charter our own railroad, the Union Pacific. This is the first uh, chartered corporation, the, the, the corporation that, um, uh, that the United States Congress chartered since the Second Bank of the United States, which Jackson had heroically defeated, as I discussed in some earlier cronyism lecture. Um, so... Uh, the railroad falls into the hands of Congressman Oakes Ames, who was on the House Pacific Railroad Committee, and he was the owner of Oliver Ames and Sons, which made shovels. So I'll never forget Rothbard talking about this, and he says, who do you think got the shovel contract right, to build the Union Pacific? Well, could it have possibly been Oliver Ames and Sons? Oliver Ames later became president of the Union Pacific. Right? This, is a, this, is, this is kind of a racket. Again, it was, a, it was sort of a, a, a sleazy... Um, uh, inside operation, so how convenient. And as I mentioned, his brother Oliver becomes president of the Union Pacific. Again, so you can start to see some of the uh, more sordid details of this of this transcontinental railroad. Right. So, <clears throat> where's the Union Pacific going to build from? Right. We know the Central Pacific is going to be built from uh, San Francisco. <sighs> Central Pacific's going to build eastward from Sacramento, California, which is near San Francisco. Uh, the Union Pacific is going to be built westward from a terminus to be decided by President Lincoln. The, the law gave Lincoln the ability to decide where the railroad would be built. All right. So how did Lincoln choose where this railroad would be built? Well, Lincoln chooses basically near Omaha, Nebraska, and Council Bluffs, Iowa. Why? Well, there's a lot of evidence to suggest that it was because he owned real estate in Council Bluffs. Of course, Lincoln himself never really benefited from this railroad because he died, but the, all of the real estate in this area shot up after it was discovered that Congress was building a transcontinental railroad starting here. And if you've ever um, uh, you've been to Omaha, Nebraska, you'll see there's a Union Pacific Museum and all this stuff. I, I was invited by um, uh, Creighton University to give a talk on cronyism, and I, I, I gave a talk on the Union Pacific because I thought, well, here's something that's kind of local to the area. And uh, much to my embarrassment, I discovered that the, you know, when I got to the university, I would be presenting in the Union Pacific room. So here I was presenting in the Union Pacific's room, basically indicting the railroad. And that was, that was a little awkward. But anyway, I uh, spoke, spoke truth to power, right? Um, so here we are. Here's the Pacific uh, Railway Act, right? For every mile of track, the railroads uh, received 6,400 acres of free land, right? And Congress gave money uh, for construction. They basically loaned uh, the railroads. They loaned them $16,000 per mile over the Plains, $48,000 per mile over the Rocky and Sierra Nevada Mountains. So the Sierra Nevada, that's in California, the small range. The Rocky Mountains, that's, of course, in the middle, right? And $32,000 per mile in between, right? So the, the Central Pacific is the red line. The Union Pacific is the blue line, right? Okay. So uh, this was an incredible amount of, um, uh, of, 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 of money and land, right? The Union Pacific ended up getting $27 million in government loans and about 12 million acres, okay? 12 million acres, that's the size of New Hampshire and New Jersey combined. They, they literally got a little kingdom, and of course it was spread out, but it's, 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 quite, um, it's quite the grab. 
The Central Pacific got $26 million uh, in loans in 9 million acres, which is the size of Maryland. Okay, so again, this is, this is, this is quite the boodle, so to speak, to use a, a term um, uh, of, of, of the time. So they got a mountain of government loans in, uh, in land that they could then sell to land speculators, they, they sell to farmers, um, and so on, right? So uh, how, did, how did the promoters profit? How did the cronies uh, profit, right? So uh, here is the whole racket, basically. As I mentioned, they wanted to make money uh, by constructing the road, not, not really by operating the road. The, <laughs> the road could be atrociously operated, but they want to make money by constructing it. So what they want to do is they want to run the construction companies that overcharge the railroads for all of the various factors of production at the taxpayer's expense. Of course, on the free market, this would be heavily uh, limited because um, who would invest in this railroad if they knew that they were intentionally, they were being paid, excuse me, uh, for overpriced uh, materials and so on. But when the government does it, as, as we've discussed, there's, there's um, a little bit of calculational chaos uh, if uh, so to speak, right? The Union Pacific ran, uh, had a construction company called Credit Mobile, right? And the Central Pacific had a construction company called the Contract and Finance Company. These 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 companies seem quite innocent enough, as we'll see. Uh, they were um, they, they they were uh, quite just sort of uh, crooked enterprises in so many words, and these it generate incredible returns, right? Credit Mobile increases the Union Pacific's construction costs, overcharging them by 50%, and it reaps, during basically five years of construction, a 480 to 610% rate of return. All right, so this is quite the, uh, the winner. This is like the NVIDIA of the past, if you will. <laughs> right? And what's great is that Oaks Ames, and we'll see he was later called Hoax Ames, uh, bribes other congressmen with Credit Mobile stock to sort of look the other way. Right, um, and and so it's just now members of Congress who voted for this law are also benefiting. All right, so this is this is quite the the, the crony racket. Right, this is quite the crony uh, enterprise. All right, uh, these roads were atrociously built, in so many words. Right, uh, they were poorly built railroads, uh, and why? Right? Is this some is the greedy capitalism? No, it's not greedy capitalism. It's the taxpayer infusion, weakens the ability of profit and loss to discipline the railroads. Right, so there was this calculational problem. They're getting money from the taxpayer, and of course, there's an incentive problem where the actual people who are um, uh, uh, really running the show are deliberately overcharging the railroad because they're they own they own much more of the uh, of the construction companies. To just give you some ideas of of, of of the ways in which this railroad was poorly built, or both railroads that were connected together, land was hastily graded to sort of figure out: okay, is it um, you know, is it proper for railroads? Is it, is it level enough? What do we need to do? And it was hastily graded because they wanted to scoop up as many land subsidies for, uh, from Congress as they could. Track was laid on uncleared snow, right? Again, to grab as much money and land as they could. And, and then when the snow melted, the railroad was like, it wasn't built properly and they had to redo it, okay? There were improperly leveled roadbeds. Again, it, it, it's not suitable uh, for, for, for durability. Right? None of this stuff a profit and law, a business driven by purely profit and loss would do. Tunnels were too narrow. That's a problem if you're running a railroad because you want to make sure that whatever you're putting on the railroad can fit through the tunnel. You're blasting through a mountain, right? You, you got to make sure you're, 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 you're building a, a, a big enough tunnel. And in Utah, the Union Pacific and the Central Pacific, where they inevitably met, they were actually building duplicate tracks as they were kind of like sort of moving around each other to try to scoop up as much, as much land and money until President Ulysses S. Grant basically said, no, you can't do this. You have to decide on a, on a position. And as we'll see, that was promontory point. So these uh, railroads um, uh, were, were being dug deeper into debt. Uh, while the construction companies prospered. The railroads were taking out more loans from the government. They were also taking out loans from the banks. And that money was just going into the railroads and then out through the construction companies. This is, this is what uh, criminal organizations have done uh, since time immemorial when they're building some sort of 
uh, project or so on. It's all just a money laundering scheme, if you will, right? So the Transcontinental was completed in 1869. The Union Pacific and the Central Pacific, they would connect that promontory point in Utah. Again, this is really the railroad, right? And it connects really at the eastern side of, of Utah. So it's one system, though it's, of course, two companies that built it. And um, everyone goes, yay. And the government goes, yay, we did it. And then they had an actual surveyor look at it and they go, yeah, this railroad's only two thirds complete because it needs to be repaired. And this was a big, this was a big problem, right? Um, and the surveyor, Isaac Morris, said there is a vast difference between getting rails down so that cars can pass over them and finishing a road. They were just so, they, they, they built this road way too quickly, way too hastily, not durably enough that this thing would not last. Right? They, didn't have an, they, they didn't have an incentive to make sure that it lasted. They made all their money basically through Credit Mobile and the Contract and Finance Corporation, right? Generating massive returns. This is, this of course, is a, uh, a big problem. So the railroads, the transcontinental railroads were quite dominant in the 1860s. The Union Pacific, the Central Pacific, they, they really kind of control Congress. But in the 1870s, the next decade, the tide sort of turns against the transcontinentals. This is the part of the crime movie where sort of the, 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 the crime overlord is facing increased heat from the government, so to speak, like that, the, the, basically the part of Scarface after the montage, uh, where everything goes downhill for Tony Montana, if you haven't seen that movie. Um, here's a great quote from two members of the Big Four. Mark Hopkins do Collis P. Huntington. When we commenced 11 years ago, this was in the early 1870s, Congress and legislation were gentle steeds. They were gentle horses. They did what they wanted. Bless me how they, how they rear and tear now. Like they're a horse that's it's hard to sort of control, right? Uh, now, why was this? How, how, how could the railroad, how could they lose all of, all of their power, so to speak, so quickly, right? And this is an especial problem because they, they uh, one, it's a translation, it's getting hard to bribe politicians, but this is, this is a problem because um, some of the government loans, they're, they're, they're starting to be due, and the railroads don't want to pay Uncle Sam. They don't really have the money uh, because, again, it just kind of went through the construction uh, went through the construction companies, and they, they don't really have these, these sort of efficient enterprises that can generate uh, profits, okay? So there's a downfall of the transcontinental railroads. What happened? All right. Well, the first thing is you have the Credit Mobile scandal in 1872. Basically, the scandal broke that Congress was... Um, uh, Congress was accepting uh, bribes, and there's a political cartoon. Uncle Sam is upset at all these congressmen, and they're, they're uh, supposed to basically commit suicide according to the old Japanese uh, uh, ritual. You can see they got, the, they got the knives there. They're all wearing the outfits and all of that. Um, so this is, people were very upset. Uh, public was furious. Hoax aims in the Union Pacific were humiliated. So this is a big problem for the Union Pacific because the scandal broke out. You might be asking what happened uh, to the Central Pacific, and the Central Pacific was able to get away with this. Why were they able to get away with this? Because they burned the evidence. Uh, the Big Four in the Central Pacific, they survive by torching the contract and finance company's books. They literally, as far as the evidence suggests, they committed arson. They just, you know, they burned all the papers and all of that. And this is why, as economic historians, we actually don't have evidence on how much the Central Pacific overcharged uh, excuse me, how much the contract and finance company overcharged the Central Pacific, like we do with Credit Mobile A, right? So uh, this, is, uh, th this, 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 is a, this is a big problem, okay? Um, we could talk about some other problems. We have the Panic of 1873, and that led to a big uh, depression in railroads. Railroads had expanded credit, or excuse me, uh, the banking system had expanded credit to railroads. They were the higher order good, uh, so they got, they, they got burned. Um, uh, in uh, 1874, the Democrats basically took control of the House, so the Republicans weren't in charge anymore, all right? And uh, this, this led to really the downfall of the Union in the Central Pacific. Their power was, was gone. But it really, it really, we could say, began with Credit Mobile A, right? So 
uh, after that, it's, this is often what happens with a lot of businesses. They, they lobby for regulations, they get crony rewards, but eventually it catches up to them, right? Uh, there's other special interest groups, uh, government officials sort of find out, the public finds out, and then they become so encumbered by the government regulations, they start to become inefficient, they ossify, and then they go bankrupt. Right? This is the story. It's like with any person in a criminal enterprise. You want to get a bunch of money. You don't really worry about a couple years later when the FBI is going to find you and put you in prison for the rest of your life. It's, it's the lure of those short-term profits. Okay? So uh, I want to finish by discussing uh, whether there were any private transcontinentals during this time period. Because as I've said, historians often reply by saying, yes, the transcontinentals, they were inefficiently built, but they could only be built with government aid. Right? You had to do it this way. The market would have not engaged in the construction of, of, of such a grandiose public good, right? connecting uh, the two coasts of the country together. That's false. We've got James J. Hill's Great Northern Railroad. Right? This is really the best illustration of a privately built railroad. right? So here's what happened. Um, in 1878, Hill purchased the St. Paul and Pacific. Uh, so the St. Paul is located in Minnesota. So this was supposed to go, as we'll see, we have a picture of this, from Minnesota basically to uh, Seattle. Okay. Uh, it is true that the railroad had received a land grant much smaller than the other transcontinentals, a 2.5 million acre land grant, mostly in Minnesota, uh, but it had gone bankrupt. And basically, the value of that crony subsidy was sort of priced into um, uh, the overall, uh, the, 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 the price of the overall asset, the railroad, and Hill was able to purchase it. Um, no one thought it was a good idea. So it wasn't like Hill was making, making off like a bandit. Uh, contemporaries criticized the purchase. It was known as Hill's folly, right? It was Hill's mistake. Uh, but Hill proved them wrong, as we'll see, right? He totally proved them wrong. How did he prove them wrong? Well, he proved them wrong by showing, uh, showing everyone that he could, uh, he could build a railroad uh, basically not using the government, not lobbying the government for favors. All right, and he built a, a much more efficient railroad. Uh, the Great Northern, here's the path. Right? As we can see, we got this map right, to the, to the, um, in, in the northern part of the country. So the lack of subsidies caused Hill to build efficiently and to be disciplined by profit and loss. Hill was able to engage in economic calculation. Hill had the right incentive structure. Remember, those things are, 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 are different, but they are linked. Okay? He used quality rails. He, built, he, built, excuse me, he bought high-quality rails from, uh, from, from Great Britain. Right? They were more expensive, but they were more durable. Uh, he also purchased land, or he tried to purchase land wherever he could, right? Purchasing land and then encouraging farmers to settle the land so he, they could have basically a steady stream of, 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 of revenue. Uh, he developed a relatively short route, right, from point A to point B. He wanted to economize on the, um, uh, economize uh, basically on how much land he had to get. And uh, he also, as I mentioned, he encouraged farmers to settle nearby after he had uh, built the railroad or at least built certain tracks of the railroad. So the Great Northern was managed much, much better than its main competitor, the government subsidized Northern Pacific. Great Northern got 2.5 million acres of land. Northern Pacific got 47 million acres of land. And we can see the Northern Pacific, look how it's a little bit more winding Again, it's because they're trying to scoop up all of, the, all of the, the land subsidies, and they're trying to create sort of this, this uh, scenic route that wasn't actually um, commercially viable. But again, they were, they were misled. They were um, um, uh, poorly disciplined by profit and loss because they were getting taxpayer assistance. All right. So in conclusion. The construction of the Union in Central Pacific is a classic example of cronyism. Right? As we can see very clearly, it enriched political insiders. It did not benefit the public. Right? Uh, the public was not uh, benefited by a government-run railroad that wasn't properly completed. And Congress was not needed to build transcontinental infrastructure, as the Great Northern, Demonst Great Northern demonstrates. Right? 
And most importantly, uh, you should pick up a free copy of Cronyism, Liberty versus Power in Early America, uh, which is downstairs, of course, and you should buy Cronyism, Rise of the Corporate State. Uh, I can't tell you enough how hard uh, copies of Cronyism are to find around the holidays, uh, around Christmas time, and especially in late January, early February, around Valentine's Day. Right, they are very high in demand, so you want to make sure you get your copies now. Right? So what are you waiting for except for the second book, right? which is coming out, uh, I believe, later in the year or early 2025, and the Mises Institute will have more information on this soon. So thank you so much for paying attention. I hope you enjoyed it.